introducing the audio and I'm waiting for people to join and we're admitting everybody. Everybody's joining the party. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, dudes and dudettes. Um, admitting all, everyone's arriving a little bit later, but it's fine. Cool. All right, so welcome to Mammals Part 2. I'll be your host, Nick. And tonight we're delving into placentals and some just some basic biology about mammals, some very basic stuff. And it's part two of our series of four, possibly six. Uh, three and four will continue next week and where we get more into detail about the specific families. And we are doing predators in particular next week. Okay. So uh, let's get carried away with ourselves and go straight on to our presentation. And away we go. All right, cool guys. So uh, welcome to the party. Mammals part two is beginning. Okay, as always, we do a book of the week and we do two books every week because we've got two classes. So the second book of the week is the Ecology book. I've had this book for about a year now. Absolutely brilliant. It's freely available, well, freely available, available at um, any uh, good bookstore. Exclusive books and bargain books, both of it available. And you can get the audio book of Audible. I have that as well. Really great to listen to when you're driving. Okay, so if you ask, what is a mammal? I think the most obvious explanation of a mammal is that they have memory glands. Um, that is one of the defining features of a mammal. Only mammals have memory glands. They have hair at some stage of their development as well. Whether it's in utero or in their fully developed adult form, all mammals will have hair at some stage. Um, they're also warm-blooded, and there's a whole science behind that. Birds are also warm-blooded, but they go by their warm-blooded behavior very differently. Ooh, Thomas is arriving. Okay, and they have an external ear structure, which means you can physically see either the ear hole or the ear itself, okay. So another big thing is that we discussed last time, they have three ear bones as opposed to one ossicles, a four-chambered heart, something that they, that birds and crocodiles also have, but can by it independently of their own hard work. And most species are live-bearing, okay. They give birth to live young. Monotremes, which we did last time, are egg-laying animals. Okay, so they're not live-bearing, but a defining feature of a mammal is not that it's live-bearing because five species of mammals don't lay, don't give birth to live young. They lay eggs. So anyone that says that they're live-bearing as a feature is talking out of their ass. Okay, so before we go on to specific mammals we're talking today, I want to talk about something that I've mentioned quite a few times, and that's convergent evolution. And we're not going to get into how evolution occurs tonight because that's a whole other class. But, um, oh, people are arriving. More oh, people, sorry. Quite a few people. Um, and we're going to talk about specifically what is convergent evolution. I've mentioned the term a couple of times. And convergent evolution is when similar ecological conditions put pressure on species to evolve in similar ways. Okay, the habitats are the same, the environment's the same, the ecology is very similar, and so there are the same selective pressures on them. And over time, you'll start finding that the same sort of organisms, or not so, the same species, but same sort of lim similar looking organisms appearing in similar habitats, whether you're in South America, Australia, or in, um, so in, in Africa. You, you have very similar things. My favorite example, easy example, is sharks, killer whales and dolphins, and ichthyosaurs. Ichthyosaurs are obviously extinct for 65 million years. The one was a reptile, the ichthyosaurs, the ones are fish, the sharks, and the one are mammals, dolphins and killer whales. They all behave very similarly, and they all kind of in their basic structure and form look very similar as well. It's just the optimal design for them. So the fact that they often look similar and act similar, it indicates that this is usually the most efficient or effective form for their survival in that habitat. And these animals themselves will fulfill similar ecological roles in their respective habitats. It also happens with plants. In South America, they have a plant called mesquite, which looks very similar to our acacia and performs very similar to our acacia because the ecological conditions are the same there, but it's not an acacia. Okay, so some examples of convergent evolution. 
The echidna, which is a cousin of a platypus, also known as a spiny anteater. He's a spiky, small, little insectivorous monetary mammal. The tenric, which is a cousin of an elephant, believe it or not. not this is not a hedgehog. I know it looks like a hedgehog. It ain't a hedgehog. It's a cousin of the elephant. They occur only in Madagascar. The actual hedgehog, which is in no way related to an elephant, uh, these are cousins of shrews and moles. And they occur mostly in the Northern Hemisphere, and we have one or two species in, in, in Africa as well. And then, of course, the last, the porcupine, which is not an insectivore, but again, a small mammal covered in spikes and uh, prefers a burrowing habitat. And the one's a rodent, the other's an insectivore, the other is a cousin of an elephant, and the other is a monotreme. Completely unrelated besides, besides the fact they're mammals. They are, as, they are more different than, um, than humans and killer whales in terms of their evolutionary history, but they perform very similar ecological roles and they have evolved in very similar ways to look similar. So people are often confused by animals and they think, well, why aren't they related? Because they look similar. Just because you look similar doesn't mean you're related. Okay, so. Modern placentals appeared in the fossil records around 100 million years ago. And um, we started to find them in both the Northern Hemisphere, or what was uh, the Northern part of the world, and the Southern parts of the world, in Guantanamo land and Eurasia. And like all ancient mammals, they were extremely rodent-like. That doesn't mean they were rodents. They weren't true rodents, but they looked like rodents. They behaved like rodents. And modern placentals have highly advanced embryonic development. It means they have a very complex system going on in the uterus. They go through a whole, uh, whole placental phase where they get, um, basically you can imagine the placenta like an egg being carried inside the body. And the, the, the young is fully formed and with all its development having occurred by the time it's born. Even though you're a baby human, all your systems are ready to go. You've got fully functioning lungs, you've got um, your legs are there, your whole body's operational and everything you need to survive as an adult is already on you. It doesn't need to grow. Okay, certain animals, especially like with um, antelope, they're ready to run from the day they're born. They're basically independent, except for having to need milk from their mother. And another thing with placentals is that their mammary glands are actually extremely pronounced. They are not like monotremes and marsupials, where they are very, very small and insignificant. Mammals have very noticeable um, mammary glands, and us being mammals, males, we tend to be very fond of that. So, um, the oldest known placental mammal was a small little rodent-like creature called Jeremiah, sounds like Jeremiah, and he was found in Northern, uh, Northern Asia as well. And this is the oldest fossil that we have, dating back to about 100 million years ago. The, the bone structure, the reason why we're able to tell it's different from a monotreme and a marsupial is the bone structure. They have key features that show that they have an ancestry that is slightly different. Now, placentals, are the most diverse of all mammals. They are found all over the world and they occupy every conceivable habitat, habitat, from the oceans to the skies. We've got bats, we've got whales, they live on the lands, they live in the deserts, they're everywhere. So they're everywhere except for Australia and New Zealand, basically. And the symbols are divided into four orders, four super orders. And they actually are, these two super orders are then actually made up of two um, subclasses. Remember, the class of mammals is broken up into um, two subclasses. And the one are the Atlantogenata, literally being generated in the Atlantic, and which are made up of the Afrotherians, Africa, and the Xenotherians, which are the weird animals. And the other are the Boreotherians. Again, if you don't remember these names, it's not important. It's just important to remember how the things are related rather than the names. Okay, you don't need to know my grandfather, you just need to know that I came from Europe. Okay, so the and the Boreotherians are made up of this really difficult word, the Euarchrogothians, say that three times, and the Laurasiatherians, say that three times. Again, scientists have to justify the income, so they come up with these very difficult names that we need to pay them to pronounce. So, anyway. Um, going back a long time ago to a place called Pangaea, 335 million years ago, this is what the world looked like. All the continents were connected with each other. Remember, this was basically when we talked about the Katahanas. This is what the world would have looked like. Over time, these continents began to break apart. Uh, the one that we often refer to in South Africa is Gondwanaland, which is made up of South America, Africa, India, Antarctica and Australia. They were all fused into one big supercontinent harboring around the equatorial belt. 
Antarctica, obviously, because it was around the equator, was not um, frozen wasteland like it is today. In fact, if you go into Antarctica with the fossil studies that are done in the area, they found many land-based animals, they found fossilized trees, they found fossilized swamps, they found all sorts of interesting things, they found reptiles and dinosaurs and birds all over the all over the entire continent of Antarctica. And only over time as it shifted towards the South Pole has it become colder and colder and all those things died out and they've their remnants were fossilized. But at a time this was all over the equator. On the other side of the world, we had Laurasia, okay, which was made up of all the continents of the Northern Hemisphere, but these guys have experienced a lot more tectonic action and they've really just torn themselves to ribbons. And Laurasia looks nothing like what the Northern Hemisphere looks like today, which is really just a mishmash uh, of broken pieces. So those are your two major groups. And because of these two major continents, although mammals have started to evolve, in these different areas, they were they had very different evolutionary timelines, and because of these evolutionary timelines and trajectories, they evolved quite differently, and that's why we have such significant differences in mammals today. They've also migrated other areas, so animals that evolved in Africa eventually ended up in Asia, but their roots are in Africa, and that's why you find certain species in Africa are more prevalent, which you'll see today. So the Atlantogenitans, these evolved in Guangdong land. They gradually dispersed to the rest of the world, and they're made up of modern Afrotherians, and these are mostly limited to Africa, but not only, you'll see, I'm sure you can think of some exceptions. And some species are found throughout the rest of the world, like elephants and pangolins, but most of the Afrotherians are found in Africa. And the modern Xenotherians, which are quite different, is in, they're only found in South America, because they broke off from, South America broke off quite early on, and these guys evolved very independently. So Afrotherians are grouped by a couple of common features. They have a high vertebral count. They have a unique placental formation, which is different to all other mammals. They have a very distinct shape of ankle bones, which everything from dugongs to dusties to elephants, um, they all have something in common. The dentition comes through very late in life, okay? Compared to other mammals, they get very late dentition. They're all plantigrade, which means they walk on a flat foot. And they have mammary glands between the front of the legs. Okay, they might sound like us, but we're a little bit different. We are somewhere else on another spectrum. We'll talk about that later. And the upper incisors are reduced in number and modified as tusks. Okay, that's starting to sound a bit, fam bit more familiar. And the molars all have ridges. These are all certain features that I'm certain you can figure out one of the animals on this list. So, the one group, Tenrix. Okay, they are only found, uh, the true tenrix are only found in Madagascar, but other related species are found in North Africa. Another group are the hyraxes or the dussies they're found throughout Africa. Again, cousins of elephants, but not the closest. The closest cousin of an elephant, I mean, if you look at his face, you can just see that they're very close cousins, are the sirens, the dugongs, the manatees, everyone's favorite. Proboscideans, which are made up of African elephants. You also get Asian elephants. And until very recently, we had the woolly mammoths who went extinct around three and a half thousand years ago. And then, of course, golden moles, which are not true moles. We have golden moles throughout Africa. Okay, In Southern Africa, there are no true moles. We have golden moles, which are a little bit cuter, in my opinion, and don't have those gross, weird-looking noses. And the last group, sorry, not the last group, the second last group are elephant shrews. Look very similar to shrews, they're a little more springy, have much bigger eyes, okay? They're not related to true shrews though. And then finally, the tubular dentatons, which is made up of the artfark, okay? So these are all Afrotherians. They all evolved in, in, in uh, parts of Africa and over time, they, certain numbers of their species may have dispersed into other parts of the world, but most of these species are still today found in Africa. They haven't dispersed anywhere else. The second group are the xenotherians, which means xena, okay, strange joints, because they have strange joints. They've got weird legs. And they're grouped by unusual limb structure. It's just odd. And the pelvis is fused to the spine, which is unique amongst mammals. And they have a single color vision and very strange teeth, really weird teeth. And again, only found in South America. And these include armadillos and ant bears. I know we call them our odd fox ant bears, but their ant bears are in America. They're hairy. They've got hair. And of course, the sloths. So there we go. Everyone knows now that sloths and armadillos are related to each other. Okay, distantly related, different families, but uh, they are related. And sloths are not related to a monkey, as a lot of people seem to think. 
Okay, the Bohr Eutherians, which is these guys evolved in Laurasia and then other continents in the northern hemisphere. And these include the modern Eucarcoglotherians. How do you say that? Eucarcoglotherians. I can never pronounce that word. And they include rabbits, rodents, and primates. Okay, and we're going to get to those guys now. And the modern Laurasiantherians. And these include, include carnivores, bats, and ungulates. So these guys over here, I'm not going to attempt to say the word again, are extremely diverse and only have a few basic common characteristics. The modern frontal feet are common in many families, um, and you'll start to see why. And most evidence is based on molecular and genetic studies and trace fossil evidence. So we found fossils, and the fossils are obviously show that they, are, they have relatives that are connected. But over time, we've done studies, and we realized how close we related to, we are to each other. So the Eucarcontoglotherians, how do you say that? Um, they uh, all have very similar uh, genetic uh, relationships, and they also are, have evolved from a common ancestor at some point in time, about 80 million years ago. One group are the lagomorphs, which are hares and rabbits. Rabbits and hares are not rodents. I know everyone says, oh, it's a rodent. It's not a rodent. It's a lagomorph. Okay, and you'll ask, what's the difference? We'll get to that in a second, beyond the fact that it has ears and likes to hop. You also get the rodentians, which are rats, squirrels, and porcupines. Those are the three basic groups of rodents, rats, squirrels, and porcupines. Rat forms, squirrel forms, and porcupine forms. So um, if, you, if you think of something like a um, um, mice, they're rat forms. Squirrels, they come in all sorts of sizes. Every, um, you get ground squirrels, climbing squirrels, and so forth. And porcupines are found throughout the world as well. So those are the three basic forms of rodents. So what is the difference between rats and rodents? There are lots of differences. But the most noticeable difference, the key difference beyond the ears, is that rabbits have a second pair of sizes that push against each other, whereas rodents simply have one pair of sizes which just munch, munch, munch like that. So that's a distinct difference between rodents and rabbits. Um, the other groups include the strepsirenes, which are the galagos and lemurs. Um, the majority of which are found in Madagascar, but of course we have Galagos in Africa as well, and the bush babies as we call them. Very, very cute. They're very primitive, very primitive primates. And the Haplorini, which are the more advanced primates, which includes monkeys, baboons, chimpanzees, gorillas, and that ugly bugger over there, which is me holding my rifle. Okay, so we're all Haplorini primates, advanced primates. Okay, so. Foot structures, before we go on, we talk about some basic foot structures. So one of the things that all these guys up until now have in common, they have a plantigrade foot structure. And most mammals and reptiles have a plantigrade foot structure. Why? Because it allows climbing, and climbing is really important. Um, other foot structures include digitigrade, ungulagrade, and so of course we've got the three. Plantigrade, digitigrade, ungulagrade. And you can see that with this, diagram of the bones that are there's the same bones just in different um, assemblies so a plantigrade moves with the entire foot on the ground a digitigrade is basically walking on the fingers or his toes and with an ungulagrade he's walking on his fingernails or on the tips of his toes and we're going to talk about why these things are important and they will have benefits based relating to their lifestyle and then here's an example again you can see a human foot a dog foot and a horse foot over here with the same joints in operation. So you can understand how they basically make up the same bones. They are, they are no different. So a plantigrade foot is the most primitive foot structure. And they uh, allow for standing or walking on the whole length of the foot. This is ideal for supporting weight, but also allowing manipulation. So if you're trying to climb things, if you're trying to get into nuts, crack open seeds, you're trying to hold fruit, you're trying to climb trees, um, you're trying to grip onto things when you're jumping around. You want to have plantigrade foot structures. You want to have the operation of your whole hand from here to here, okay? Now we're plantigrade because we walk in the whole of our foot, okay? Dogs, by contrast, are not plantigrade. We're gonna talk about that in a second. So they, the entire foot rests on the, on, the, on the ground from the phalange to the calcaneus, which is the heel. The next foot is the digitigrade. And they're slightly more advanced than the plantigrade foot, and the heel and the instep are raised off the ground so that only the digits touch the ground. And this gives a smaller surface area, but um, 
it also allows the frontal limbs to grip and attack. It has a less grip. If you ever watch your cat trying to hold a toy, it doesn't have the ability to grip as well as we do, or as any primate does, or any rat does for that matter. But um, it still allows to grip and to attack. Okay, so it allows some manipulation. But the smaller surface area gives you more quiet movement. Even when you're trying to be quiet, you walk on your tippy toes. That is you walking in a digit grade function. Uh, now, this is reserved for ballerinas. Angular grade, dancing on your tippy toes. So this is a highly evolved foot structure. And these animals are referred to as ungulates. And you get two kinds, even-toed and odd-toed. So even toes have two toes, and odd toes have one toe or three toes. So horses are odd-toed and even toad will be any antelope, okay? And they're highly adapted to running. Small surface areas reduces less drag, less friction, and they can build up a lot more speed. Um, and these animals stand on the tips of their toes. So they're running just on their, basically on their fingernails or on their toenails. So going back to the Laurasian therians, they're an extremely varied group with a wide range of related features. They all have highly modified foot structures and they are extremely varied in their diets. Pangolins, phyllodotas, okay, they're distant cousins of carnivores, believe it or not. Okay, so cats and pangolins, distant ancestors. I know these guys are more reptilian, but the reptilian scales just coincidental. They just they've evolved over time for protection. Carnivorans, which we're going to discuss in day today. Um, next week we're doing a full-on workshop on carnivores, though. Now, carnivores are characterized by certain features. They have enlarged canines. A distinct sagittal crest, which I'm going to explain in a second, along the skull, an enhanced carnosal shear, a digitally grade foot structure. All carnivores have fused bones in their feet, which is called the scapular nerve bone. This gives their foot just more strength and more fusion um, so they don't break their toes when they're running. Okay, uh, And they also have large eyes with binocular vision. And most species are purely carnivorous, but several are omnivores. Dogs, in fact, many members of the dog form um, predators are omnivores, bears, for example. Um, and even panda bears, for example, are essentially fully herbivorous, although they have been known to eat meat from time to time. So what is a carnosal shear? Carnosal shears are carnosal teeth, which are molars, which are modified into being basically serrated blades, and they just help cut and chew meat as the animals are, are ripping through and tearing flesh. So they've surpassed the role of a molar into the secondary role of a cutting device. A sagittal crest is this ridge that runs down the back of the animal's skull, and this allows for muscles, all that extra biting strength to grip around and wrap around the skull and give that animal all the extra, it's, got an, it's an anchor point for all that biting strength. So the larger the sagittal crest, the more pronounced uh, the biting power. The smaller the sagittal crest, so cats tend to not have a lot of biting power because they more go for piercing rather than crushing and chewing. So they don't, the cats usually don't have a very powerful sagittal crest. Animals that do have a powerful, uh, have a large sagittal crest, like hyenas, because they rely more on brute strength just to bite and break through bone and rip up, uh, you know, rip up large chunks of meat. Um, dogs as well, because they tend to chew more. Cats don't chew as much, so they don't have comparatively as large as sagittal crest. Uh, other, other animals like uh, gorillas have a huge sagittal crest, but that's simply because they want that crushing power for when they chew nuts and breaking down large fibrous roots. So it does evolve in then primates as well, but with cats, it's the sagittal crest, or with predators, specifically for eating meat. A digitally grade foot. Now this over here is where his heel would be, but over here it was the cute little toes. And we've got two kinds of, of, of or two suborders of predators or carnivores. And the one of the caniforms, and these include the canidae, which are the dogs, foxes, and wolves, the ursidae, which are bears, the pinnipedidae, which are seals, walruses, and sea lions, and the class are the musilodians, which are the raccoons, skunks, red pandas. Red pandas and all pandas are not related. They just have to be called pandas. And weasels, badgers, and otters. So, Normal pandas are bears, and red pandas are actually cousins of foxes. And weasels, badgers, otters, raccoons, and skunks, and red pandas are all related. Believe it or not. The other group are the filiforms, which are cats, and the catforms. So we have the philidae, which are cats, the vivariidae, which are civets and genets, the hyenidae, which are hyenas and artwolf, and the herpestidae, which are mongoose. And we're going to, again, we're doing a whole workshop on these guys next class. So 
There's a, if you guys have got questions, you can either save them for the Q&A tomorrow, but chances are we'll answer most of them in the workshop on Tuesday next week. So going back to these skulls over here, you can actually see when you take away all the fur, when you take away all the flesh and all the muscle and the skin, these skulls are almost indistinguishable. They are very, very, very similar. Um, and we've got a mi mixture of caniform and filiform predators over here. And you'd have a hard time, I'm pretty sure right now, you'd have a hard time telling which one is which. I'm sure one of you should be able to tell at least two of them apart. But I think you'll be surprised. So A, B, C, D, E, and F. So going back, A is a Mediterranean monk seal. B is a European honey badger. C is a fossil, which is a cat-like animal from Madagascar. D is the American black bear. E is a brown hyena. And F is a wolverine. And again, easy to mistake them. Uh, and they all look very similar in terms of their skeletal structures. And with these sorts of skeletal relationships, you can see how close the animals are related. And all the other pomp and top, the fur and the skin, that's just appearance and that's just cosmetic really. The core differences are at a bone level. Okay, so going back to the Laurasiotherians, the Chirpterans are bats. Now bats are pretty cool. A lot of people seem to think they're rodents, but they're not. They're, as you can see, completely unrelated to rodents. And they come in two forms, two groups, the macro Chirpterans, which are fruit eating bats, and the micro Chirpterans, which are insect eating bats. I love bats and a lot of people hate them, but they're as more likely to carry rabies, or your dog's more likely to get rabies than any bat. And bats hang or cling upside down when they rest with the hind limbs, which act as hooks. And bats can lock the digits of their hind feet to prevent falling. So they just cling to their, their little perch when they're sleeping. They're not as blind as people think. Um, in fact, some of them are actually excellent by outside, especially, especially the fruit eating bats, which navigate purely on smell and sight because they can't hear fruit. And the senses of smell and hearing in many species, particularly the microchirpterans, are excellent. And all bats have incisors, canines, premolars, and molars, fully fledged teeth. And insect eating bats have molars with sharp crests, which, um, while the molars of fruiting bats are flat, obvious because the one needs to eat animals and the other needs to eat fruit. So the diets dictate different teeth. And they all have broad thumbs, which allows them to grip onto things and clamber around. So microchirpterian bats, these are the small little bats, literally micro bats. And they can consume up to 25% of their body weight in a night. A single six gram bat can consume around 600 mosquitoes in an hour. The largest microchirpterian in South Africa is Commerson's leaf mown bat and has a wingspan of almost 60, 60 centimeters. So it's not exactly a micro bat, although it's still pretty small. And the, the smallest is the banana bat, which is only around three to five kilograms, a little bit like that. Okay. Now, macrochirpterans are fruiting bats. Most of them don't eat, uh, don't use the echolocation. I think only one does, one in Egypt, I can't remember its name. Um, and the males use distinct vocalizations to call to the females. Females give birth to the pups once per season in the summer, and the female will carry her babies on her nightly excursions out into the wild. And they have two claws on each wing for clambering onto trees and handling food. So they are more adept at climbing and clambering around than the uh, insect eating bats because insect eating bats don't have to clamber and climb around for food. They catch them on the wing. Now, another group of animals are the Parisodactylans. Okay, these are the odd toed ungulates. These animals either have a single fused toe, like the equines, horses, donkeys, and zebras or they have three toes together with a large middle toe. Lauren is very late. Okay, with a large middle toe, as in the rhinos, they, will have, they also have a very primitive di digestive system. They're all hind gut fermenters, and they tend to be bulk feeders. So what is hind gut fermentation? So with, with hind gut fermentation, the food is completely digested in the stomach and when it moves into the large intestine and in the cecum, where bacteria ferment the cellulose. Plants have cellulose um, and it's very difficult to digest. And the cecum is a change of fermentation and absorption in the actual intestinal tract. So it's this little pocket of the intestine. And the protein digestion in these animals is less efficient than in ruminants, but they make up for this by eating double the amount of food. They literally just scoff down as much as they can. And they're very good for, you'll find that these animals are bulk feeders and they just clean the bush out of all the, the crap, all the just the dry moribund grass, all the really poor quality leaves. And these guys just go through all that stuff because there's lots of it and they just 
munch through it. White rhinos and horses, they just clean up all the, all the really poor quality grass and all the really poor quality browsing and grazing. Now, by contrast, we have the set artiodactylins. They used to be called the artiodactylins, but we've included the cetaceans amongst them because of recent genetic studies and fossil studies. So it's called the set artiodactylins. And these guys include animals that have highly modified limbs, okay? And the terrestrial species either walk on two or four toes, hippos only being, being the only ones that walk on four toes, while others walk on two toes. Cloven hooves. The aquatic species, as in the whales and dolphins, are carnivorous or filter feeders. And the digestion is either a simple high grade fermentation in certain of the more primitive members, or in the more complex ones, a com complex ruminant digestion. And we'll talk about that in a second. So some of these guys include the talipodins, the camels. There are no wild camels left on the planet, planet as far as we know. All camels to the best of our understanding, have all been domesticated. They used to be wild, but they've all been domesticated. Uh, the souvenirs or the suedes, which are the pigs and warthogs and all the pig forms. The ruminants, which is pretty much anything with a horn or an antler. And let's talk about specifically the ruminant for a second. Now, here's Daisy the cow, and you can see she's got four stomachs, what they, what they call four stomachs, but it's actually not four stomachs, it's four chambers to a stomach. They have one stomach with four chambers. I know a lot of guys in school, they were taught that cows have four stomachs. Just because you've got four rooms doesn't mean you've got four houses in your house. Okay, so she's got a rumen, a reticulum, and a marsum, and an obomarsum. Don't even remember those names unless you're doing some sort of veterinary studies. And they have a four-chambered stomach. So when they swallow food, it moves directly from the first section into the first section, which is the rumen. The rumen then digests the food, ferments it, and they regurgitate this. Pretty gross. And they chew this continuously for a long time, mixing with saliva and just breaking down even more. They call this chewing the cud. So you'll see cows, deer, antelope just sitting for hours, chewing away with that gormless stare. Uh, after a while, the cud is then passed back down to the second stomach, the reticulum. It's broken down even further. The digestive process continues when it goes into the third section, the amasin, and finally the abomasin, where it's literally ground down to this powder. And every little bit of cellulose, every protein is broken down to a very, very simple level. And the animal is able to digest um, very small amounts of food and get the optimal amount of energy out of it. So that's why these guys can exist in high numbers in the bush, because they don't actually need that much comparatively to survive. Um, by contrast, they are able to survive of relatively little food. Other animals like um, zebras have to bulk feed, you know, just chow all the time just to get by. Okay, now the rumens are divided into six families. The Atragulidae, which are the Shivertons. We've only got one species in Central Africa, which the, they look like Sunnis or Dakers. Uh, the Giraffes, the Pronghorns, limited to the Americas. The Musk Deers, also limited to the Americas. Deer, which is limited predominantly to the Northern Hemisphere. Africa has no native deer species. And the Bovidae, if it's got horns, it's part of the Bovidae. So that's antelope, cattle, sheep, and goats. Okay, so what's the difference between deer and antelope? Well, antelope have horns, deers have antlers. And what's the difference between antlers and horns? Very simple. Antlers grow from the tip. They're made up of solid bone, which is what they call velvet, the casual term, which is very velvety. And they shed every season. Okay, they start to grow at the, um, at the end of winter, into summer they grow, and then coming into winter again, they shed them. They're a lot more branchy in shape and they just generally be a lot more of a hindrance. They're purely for territory. Horns, by contrast, are permanent. They are never shed. Okay. Um, they grow from the base and they're a bone covered in keratin, basically the same as your fingernails. So they're, they're distinctly different, antlers and horns. So deers of antlers, antelope, and all their cousins have horns. Okay, now the said arterodactyl uh, suborders also include the whippermorphs, which are hippos and whales. And we're going to again do a workshop on the marine mammals in the future. We're going to seals, we're going to dugongs and manatee, and explain how these guys are all different and what they do that is ecologically different. The last group we're going to be talking about are the Uliopatilias, okay, which are moles, shrews, hedgehogs. And these guys, again, have a variety of forms. They're all pretty much insectivorous to gradual lesser degrees. Some do supplement their diets with some vegetation, but for the most part, they're purely eat insects. 
Okay, so one thing these guys all have in common is they're endothermic. And all mammals have a temperature of about 36.5 36 degrees Celsius. And they generate their own warmth either through muscular activity, through shivering, which is what I'm doing now because it's cold, and um, or they do through biochemical reactions, which we do as well. Okay. So the benefits of endothermy, of it being an endothermic animal, is that you have faster moving muscles. You have all this hot, warm energy in your body pumping fresh nutrients and fresh warm blood into your muscles and into your joints, just getting you going faster. We tend to be a lot more energetic. Reptiles, by contrast, on a cold day, they're very sluggish. I mean, you can you can catch a puff adder without even trying, um, and you'll be able to put it in a bucket before it bites you if it's really cold. It's like two or three degrees up there, they can barely move. Don't try that. Um, but the best time to catch a snake is when it's cold. Okay. Um, mammals, by contrast, we can move whether it's minus 15 or you know 40 degrees. We're pretty much operating at the same speed all the time. You don't rely as much on the environment for heat, okay? We're self-reliant. We also have improved brain power. You know, your brain requires warm blood, so the, the, the fact that your blood is always warm means that you're generally more intelligent. You have better cognitive ability. That's why mammals are smarter than reptiles, and birds are smarter than reptiles, because they have that warm blood. Uh, they have a faster waste removal. Their digestions, digestions work quicker. And if you have pet snakes like I do, one of the biggest hassles is if you if you – the temperature is too cold in the tank, the snake can actually have the food start to rot in the stomach before it digests it. And again, the snake gets sepsis and it dies, and you don't want that. So uh, having warm blood gives you faster waste removal and a faster digestion in general. And also being larger, you generate your own heat, which means you can afford to be much bigger in colder climates, which means you can dominate in colder climates. Uh, smaller animals are reliant on heat, so they have to be smaller in order to heat up faster. Okay, now of course, um, like everything, like every benefit, there's also drawbacks. Uh, being endothermic is extremely expensive in terms of resource requirements. You're running a furnace 24 seven. It's very, very expensive. You require more food. Your metabolism is much higher. It also limits your body shape because you want to have a better ratio of surface area to body mass. So you can't be very serpentine. You need to be more oval or more circular. You cannot be very elongated because you have all that exposed body area. Um, Tina, um, if you want to ask me a question, we can get back to this tomorrow in Q&A or WhatsApp me after this. Um, the limits, it also limits the minimum size because if you're very small, you lose heat very quickly if you're endothermic. So smaller animals, uh, there's a pretty much a cap on the smaller size an endothermic animal can be. They can't be smaller than usually a small mouse. You won't find tiny little uh, warm-blooded animals that size, but you will find frogs and you will find lizards this size and you'll find insects this size because they are more receptive to the heat of the environment and they are relying on different factors. Also, a big factor that people don't concern is that being warm-blooded makes you a, a target for predators that hunt with heat. Um, pythons and adders, um, a lot of them, pit vipers in particular, use heat to detect prey and when you're nice and glowing and warm at night, you're very easy to find. So being warm-blooded has a drawback, whereas if you're cold-blooded, something like a pit viper is going to have a hard time finding you if you're the same temperature as the rest of the area around you. Okay, we're basically wrapping up tonight's class, but in future classes, we're going to be doing uh, an understanding of the family, specifically predators and accession. We are doing the ecology of each order and family, how they interact, um, behavior, which we, is an ongoing process, and before we go into those concepts, so let's talk a bit about body shape and metabolism. And the shape of the animal, sorry, the smaller the mammal, the higher the metabolism, and the, the more it must eat relative to its body size. A 50 gram shoe will consume, consume more than 10 times more food than that of a 40 kilogram wolf and 30 times more food than a nine kilo, 900 kilogram buffalo. Smaller animals like uh, smaller mammals like rodents, bats, shrews, and weasels must spend far more time hunting, foraging, and eating than larger mammals. And the smaller shrews that weigh two grams may eat more than um, more than their own body weight every single day. Some of them eat even two or three times their body weight every day. Imagine you eating two or three times your own body weight every day. And they will literally starve to death in a few hours if they don't if they're deprived of food. They just need to eat all the time. Elephants, by contrast, only have to eat around two to three body two two to three percent of their body weight every single day. So a six-ton elephant has to eat three hundred kilograms of food. Sounds like a lot, but it's only two percent of three percent of his body weight. Not that much. So this is how the chart works. So you can see over here, the bigger the animal, how much less he needs to eat 
in terms of food. An elephant is 200,000 times the size of a mouse, but his metabolic race is one twelfth as large. So it just goes down significantly in size. And even with whales, whales are only eating maybe about half a percent of their body weight a day because they're just so gigantic. And this all has to do with mass to surface ratio.